Let's all stand together this morning. church family. Morning. My name is Donna. I'm so glad to be here with you today. It's my honor and privilege to share some scripture with you. I've chosen Daniel 2 verses 20 to 22 and they say, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. 
It is he who changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and greater knowledge to those who have understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. If you would pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Our dear Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. You are kind. You have provided salvation for us, and we thank you for a gift greater than anything we could deserve or earn. Lord, you have provided it for us, and we thank you. We pray today that as we seek your truth in our lives, our personal lives, our lives as we reach out to other people, may we seek your light, your truth. And may all this be done today as we worship you, that you might receive the honor and the glory, and we just want to share our love with you. When we leave here today, help us to take that love you have given to us and extend it to those around us, that they too might see your truth, your love. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Donna. Go ahead and be seated. I want to welcome everybody today. It's good to have you here worshiping with us. For those of you who are joining us online, they're on the YouTube uh, live stream. We're glad to have you with us as well. Um, if you are visiting, there is a visitor's card in the pew back right in front of you. And if you would take a moment to fill that out for us, we would appreciate it. When the offering plate comes by, if you put that in there later on in the week, I'll send you some more information about our church. And um, we have this wonderful muffin ministry. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia is our baker, and she's also our visitor. And if you put in a visitor's card, she's probably going to show up at your door one day soon with a big old plate of muffins. So... <laughs> Uh, but we do appreciate the fact that you're worshiping with us. Hey, we have a tradition at Oak Hill Baptist that if somebody sends us a thank you card for an active ministry, we always share it with the congregation on Sunday mornings. And this one is from uh, Scott and Donna Lacey. Uh, Donna's dad passed away recently. It says, Dear Church Family, Scott and I would like to thank you all for the love and support you showed us as I recently went through the loss of my father. Your prayers and messages of hope and strength meant so much to us. We're blessed to be part of such a loving, supportive, and praying church. Thank you, and God bless you, Scott and Donna Lacey. Yeah, and we'll continue to pray for your family. Um, a few items of church news. Uh, first of all, the quarterly business meeting that would typically be held on March 12th has to be rescheduled to March 19th. And the reason is um, we have a special guest that's going to be with us on the 12th. He's a Romanian pastor, a missionary pastor by the name of Aniel Naste. Uh, I've known Aniel since he was a teenager. Uh, he was a friend of my son's when my son lived over in Romania for a year. And Aniel went on to become a missionary pastor uh, doing humanitarian work in gypsy villages and then out into Moldova. And um, recently he's been running supplies into uh, Ukraine and into the refugee camps. And um, our friend Steve Tate up in Maryland has taken a couple of teams over there to work with Aniel, and they've gone up into those refugee camps. In any event, Aniel's going to be here uh, in the United States in March. He's going to be in Crossville that second week of March, and he's going to be speaking here at Oak Hill Baptist Church on March 12th. And uh, he'll do a PowerPoint presentation. He'll tell you all about his ministry there to the refugees. Now, an interesting side note on that. Aniel was here once before about 10 years ago. We had him here at Oak Hill Baptist Church. Uh, and I had him preach his very first sermon in English here in this church. Now, he's preached many others since then, but the first one in English was right here at Oak Hill Baptist Church. And so now he's going to be back here on the 12th to uh, visit with us and tell us all about what he's doing, and we'll have a, a potluck afterwards so you can spend more time with him. Uh, something else, tonight we're going to start our Sunday night Bible study. It's an introduction to Oak Hill Baptist Church, and it's for all those who have become new members recently. Uh, also, all those who have just been visiting and they'd like to know more about the church. Um, anybody else, it's wide open. We're hoping some of our regular members will come and to share some thoughts about their experiences here in our church family. Uh, but even if you haven't signed up for it, we want to invite you to come. For those of you who received a new member's gift bag, you had one of these little books in that bag. This is the new member's guide. 
Okay, if you would bring that tonight. I'll have one of these for everybody else who doesn't have one yet. But if you got one of these in your new member's gift bag, if you'd bring it tonight, I would appreciate it. You'll need that. Uh, and then the last thing I'll tell you right now is we do have a mission trip coming up to the coal mining region of Kentucky. The last weekend in um, March, we'll be bringing up 125 food boxes. Um, we're providing, helping to provide 125 hams and then a lot of clothes. The whole thing is rather expensive. It's going to cost about $7,000 for all the food, all the hams, the rental truck, all the uh, transportation. And we've raised about 5,000 of that so far. So that's pretty significant, but we still have about 2,000 more to go. And uh, so if you haven't had a chance to contribute to that yet, just write Easter food on your offering envelope and then tell your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers about it because a lot of what the money that we get comes from outside sources and that's how we're able to do this three times a year. Um, kind of expensive but it's great ministry, meets a real need and um, that's where we're at right now. We have about 5,000 out of 7,000. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take a few minutes to welcome each other to the church. Uh, go around and find somebody you don't know. Let's come on back to our seats and we'll continue our song service. Good morning, Pastor. I gave your wife that thing. All righty. What, what he gave a long time ago. Okay. Well, we have a couple, we about have three birthdays coming up this week. They're March birthdays, but Joyce was good enough to add them to our bulletin so we could recognize them this week. So we won't be behind again. So as our choir comes up to uh, take their places again, uh, we have Rihanna. Is it Rihanna? Rihanna Corson, March 3rd. Brenda Herring is also March 3rd. And then Christopher Wakefield is March the 4th. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll get the, we're going to do it a week at a time, so we'll get to sing to them in the next few weeks. That's great. All right. Are we ready, Miss Brooke? Yep. Congregational song is Victory in Jesus. Let's all stand together.
participatory song is going to be Great is Thy Faithfulness. can be seated. Let's all stand together for one last praise song before pastor comes and brings the message. It's I am not alone.
when I walk through deep waters, I know that you will be with me. When I'm standing in the fire, I will not be as we end that song 
What a wonderful, powerful truth that we're never alone. In this congregation, Lord, every single person, every single person who's here today and who's visiting with us online has something going on in their life that they wish wasn't there. Every single person carries some hurt, some struggle. Uh, what a great truth to know we're not alone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, for never leaving us, for never forsaking us. Uh, we praise you in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. And we'll dismiss the children to Children's Church as they're coming down. Uh, and uh, something we didn't talk about in the announcement time. Um, there is an insert in your bulletin that will tell you a little bit more about some of the events we have coming up with the Lighthouse Christian Camp over in Smithville. Uh, there are some activities for those children, including the children from Cumberland County, and we need some, uh, uh, some volunteers to go as drivers of the van, uh, uh, chaperones as well, and uh, participants in the activities at the camp. And so you can see Donna Lacey, and she can tell you more information about how you can be involved in that. The other thing I need to let you know is that Regina Randolph did make it home last night from Africa. Uh, she was over there for a little more than a month, I believe, uh, serving with Samaritan's Purse and helping them to set up an emergency hospital for a typhoid outbreak over there. But uh, she got home very late last night, and uh, so she appreciates all your prayers. And uh, we'll be seeing her and Mark again uh, here probably beginning next Sunday. So, we're going to study the entire book of 2 John today. The whole thing. All 13 verses. Yeah, it's not often you get an entire book of the Bible in a single sermon, but you're going to get it today. Um, we've been working our way through that series of letters in that section of uh, the New Testament. 1 and 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. And today we'll be looking at 2 John. And let me ask you something. How faithful do you need to be in order to be faithful? I mean, you know, for instance, you know, if your car starts two out of three times, is your car being faithful? <laughs> if your newspaper delivery person skips delivering your paper only once each week, are they being faithful? If you consistently call in, to your job, say twice a month that you're not coming in. Are you being faithful? If you only miss making your mortgage payment twice a year, will the bank say, well, you know, 10 out of 12 in bed? No. <laughs> Probably not, huh? Uh, how faithful do you have to be in order to be faithful? You know, when it comes to cars starting and newspapers being delivered and you showing up at work when you're supposed to be there and making your mortgage payments and making them on time, a good deal more faithfulness is expected than, you know, just, I, I do it most of the time. Is most of the time enough? And the answer, of course, is no. It has to happen all the time. The car needs to start every time. And you paid for all those newspapers, so you can expect to have every one of them delivered. And your boss rightly expects you to be where you're supposed to be. If you're on the schedule, he expects you to be at work. And your bank insists that every mortgage payment be made. And on time. There's no wiggle room in matters like that, and we all know it. And so the question is, how faithful do we Christians have to be in the practice of our faith and in honoring God by obeying His commandments in order to be faithful? Is 10 out of 12 okay? I mean, maybe we can't get away with that with the bank, but can we get away with it with God? Is there any wiggle room with Him? Well, you know, as it turns out, the Apostle John wrote us a letter about that. We call it Second John. And now, John starts this letter out by identifying himself as the elder, and he identifies the recipients as somebody he calls the elect lady and her children. And Bible scholars are a little bit divided on who exactly these people were. 
uh, there's a, a smaller school of thought that believes this was an actual woman and her children that John knew when he was writing this letter to them. The larger school of thought is that the elect lady, that was a pseudonym for a, a church or perhaps a group of churches, and the children are the members. Uh, and in my personal opinion, that makes more sense. Okay, see, we know from history that during this period, the elder John provided oversight and pastoral leadership to an entire group of churches in and around the city of Ephesus. And we also know that he had a history of writing letters to the Christian community at large. Uh, the Gospel of John being the primary one. Uh, the, the letter of 1 John. Um, the book of Revelation. Now, as we're going to see next week, the letter of 3 John, that was written to an individual, but in that case, the individual is identified by name. Okay, his name was Gaius, and he tells us who he's writing to. Uh, so here, in this letter, 2 John, I think the elect lady was probably a church, or perhaps the church, capital C, as in the whole church, everybody, all the little churches put together, and the children are the members. Now, this letter of 2 John, it's also very consistent with the other letters, 1 John, 1 and 2 Peter, Jude. Like I said, they were all written around the same period in Christian history um, for the same general purpose. This was a time when um, there was a lot of persecution of Christians, and there was a lot of opposition to the Christian faith. And Christians were now scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And life was hard for many of them. And John's intent in this letter uh, and the other letters, their intent was to offer encouragement and guidance regarding how to faithfully live the Christian life in the middle of all those difficult circumstances. And, you know, that's true for us too. Uh, we live in tough times too with respect to matters of faith. Uh, and that being the case, the lessons of this letter apply as much to us as they did to the original recipients. And so, in this letter, John's going to urge us to know the truth, practice the truth, and protect the truth. And he said, he's going to tell us, he's going to teach us that our faithfulness, and in fact our faith, is going to depend on this. So let's get into this and see... Uh, the, what lessons John has to teach us about truth and faithfulness. And the first one is, know the truth. We are in 2 John, verse 1. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that remains in us, and, we will, be and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. So John starts out here by telling us, his readers, that he loves us in the truth. And not only does he love us in the truth, but so does everybody else who knows the truth. And that's true because he says here, that truth remains in us and will be with us forever. So, what truth? is John writing about here. What is, whatever this truth is, John believes that he and them and us are all in it, and it will remain in us forever. Well, I believe the truth that John's talking about here, first of all, he's talking about it in two ways. First of all, this is about Jesus. All right? Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said this about himself. He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. And we are all in him, and he is in us. And this is what Jesus was referring to, by the way, uh, in his great priestly prayer in John chapter 17, when he said this, he, he was praying to the Father, and he says, May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us. There's a spiritual unity being described there uh, that we become part of through our faith in Jesus Christ. So I think that's the first way that John was using the word truth here. Jesus is the truth. 
And all those who have placed their faith in him as Savior and Lord are in him, and he is in us, and we are all united together, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the truth that is Jesus Christ. And so that being the case, we can infer right up here, right up front, that John was writing this specifically to Christians who are united to one another through a common and shared faith in Jesus Christ. And John wants us to know the truth in that way. Or in other words, to know Jesus as the truth and to remember that we share that common bond. Okay. Then the second way in which John uh, used this word, uh, and then we're going to see this as we work our way through the letter now, is he's referring to the truth of the Word of God. He's referring to the truth of biblical doctrines as opposed to the lies of the world and uh, the lies of the false teachers who were infiltrating the churches back then and even today. John's point is that we are to know that truth, the, tr- the, tr- the, tr- ba-da, ba-da. the truth of pure biblical principles, pure biblical, d- biblical doctrine. Uh, we're to remain united in that truth. So, those two shared understandings of the truth, Jesus as the truth and biblical doctrine as the Word of God, those two elements of truth serve to unite Christians everywhere. Let me tell you here this morning, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and if you're committed to the truth of God's Word as the doctrine under which you live your life, you're a brother or sister of mine, and we can have fellowship together, and we can work together for the cause of Christ. And that should be true regardless of anything else that is different between us. And you know, I've had the privilege of experiencing that truth right there uh, on more occasions than I can remember. Uh, I'll never forget one experience I had in Chicago. It was as a fairly new Christian. I I was in the last years of my career in the Navy. Uh, I had just completed six months of advanced training in Newport, Rhode Island, in preparation for my last assignment in the Navy as a department head on a Navy ship. I was going to be a chief engineer. uh, And I was driving cross country from Newport to my home in San Diego, but I had to go by way of Chicago for two more weeks of advanced training uh, before I could get back to San Diego. So anyway, while I was there in Chicago, I attended a little Baptist church in a suburb of Chicago. I was on a Sunday morning. And when I got there, there was a family that greeted me at the door. And it was a young man and his wife and his two small children. And they welcomed me and we talked for a few minutes and I told them my story. Uh, And they invited me to sit with them in the worship service. And when it was over, they asked me to come to their home to have lunch. And then they invited me to just stay and spend the afternoon because they knew I had nowhere to go. And I sat there and watched a ball game. And then we all went back to church that night. Now, here's the thing. We had never met before that morning. But because we had a shared faith in Jesus Christ and we had a shared commitment to the teachings of the Bible, there was an immediate connection. There was a comfort level there that would not have been there if we didn't have that shared faith. Well, in a very similar vein, you know, I've had the privilege all these decades now, 30, 40 years, uh, of traveling around the world to more than 30 different countries. And I've met brothers and sisters in Christ from many different cultures And although we had never met before, we came from completely different worlds. In many cases, we didn't even speak the same language. But because we had that shared faith in Christ and that shared commitment to the Word of God, there was an immediate connection. There was a comfort level that would not have been there otherwise. This is the kind of thing that John is describing right here. And it's something that we need to remember as we meet other Christians for the first time. Look, despite our differences, we have a very important shared connection because of the truth. The truth that is Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, and the truth that is the Word of God. And, And folks, we need to remember that about each other. We need to remember that about other Christians. We have we have that shared connection of faith in our Lord and commitment to biblical truth. All this other stuff is secondary. It's third or fourth or fifth on the priority list. Okay, this is what matters the most. And if we have that, we have a connection at the soul level. 
We need to remember we have that shared connection and we need to allow that to draw us together. Okay. So that's the truth that John is talking about here and that's the truth he's establishing here as he begins this letter. And so he tells us, know that truth. And then he goes on and he says, practice that truth. Look at verse 4. He says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth in keeping with the command we have received from the Father. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I were writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commands, and this is a command, as you have heard it from the beginning, that you walk in love. All right, so what John does here, after he establishes and reminds us of the truth that, that, that is a common connection that we have, a shared faith in Jesus, a shared commitment to biblical truth. Uh, he reminds us uh, of this shared commitment to love one another, to walk in love. And he's returning us to a point that he had stressed very strongly in the letter of 1 John in numerous places. In chapter 2 of 1 John, he, he had said that loving each other was actually a test of our faith. And he said that was both an old command in that it was carried over from the Old Testament and it's a new command in that Jesus told us very specifically to do this. He told us twice in the Gospel of John in chapters 13 and 15. And in fact, in John 13, 34, he said this, this is my command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, when John says here, in 2 John, verse 5, that he is not writing us a new command, it's because we already have all that we need. From the beginning, he says. And what he's referring to here is that this has been well covered by Moses in the Old Testament and by Jesus in the Gospels. And all John was doing here in 1 John and then again in 2 John is reminding us of that important truth that we need to be intentional about practicing. And that's why John hit it so hard in 1 John. And he's repeating it here now in 2 John. As a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 4, he said this, If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother or sister. Now, when people hear this, they, they, they hear these preachings about the unity and walking in love and you know, mercy and grace and all this. It's at this point, and it's true in every church, well, we have people who immediately jump right up and say, well, oh, that's true, but we're also commanded to judge each other and to hold each other accountable. And because I do that, it doesn't mean I hate somebody or I don't love them. As a matter of fact, my judging and my accountability, that is an act of love. And my response is, yes, but. In my experience, People who norm, normally naturally default to that caveat tend to be the same people who are very proficient at fault finding and nitpicking. Uh, it, it seems that when you're dealing with people like that, with that mindset, whatever the, whenever the topics of unconditional love or um, love for fellow believers, protecting the unity of the fellowship, topics like that are addressed, Almost always they're the ones who jump up and say, yeah, but judging, accountability, uh, those are biblical too. Uh, well, that's true. But sometimes it seems like they're a little too eager to go there. Uh, and you know what? If you survey the landscape of the Christian church in the United States of America today, you discover that there's no lack of fault finding and nitpicking and finger pointing and judging. As a matter of fact, that's precisely why there are so many conflicts and fights and splits in our churches. It's because people tend to be entirely too eager to object and criticize and point fingers. I mean, all in the name of Jesus, you understand. There's a very good reason that Jesus and Paul, and John, and Peter all hit this subject 
of love and unity and humility and grace and long-suffering. They hit it so hard in their teachings and in their writings. Being kind, being gracious, being long-suffering with each other, defaulting to love, preserving the unity of the fellowship. All of those things are addressed much more often and much more strongly than judging and accountability. And so, as a church family, our goal needs to be to achieve that same measure between the two sides that the New Testament gives us. Although judging and holding people accountable are addressed in the New Testament, and it is something that we do need to do, those subjects are actually taught infrequently compared to unity, love, long-suffering. And that's for a reason. It's because we are prone to fault find and judge and want to hold accountable by nature. That's our nature. We're going to do that anyway. The reason that love and unity and humility and patience and grace demonstrated towards other believers is addressed so many times by so many teachers, so many different writers in the New Testament is because this is the side of our human nature that needs the most attention and the most discipline. This is the side of our nature that we need to be most intentional about controlling and disciplining. Folks, I'm just going to tell you, in my opinion, shrugging it off and keeping our mouths shut is the right answer about 90% of the time. It just is. There aren't that many things that are that important to warrant making a big deal out of it. Now, to accomplish that, I mean, this is a matter of spiritual growth. Okay, this is a matter of cultivation. This is something that the Holy Spirit develops in us over time. And so to accomplish that, to achieve and maintain that kind of a healthy, nurturing environment in the church, I think it's absolutely essential for all of us to maintain an attitude of love and humility and patience with each other. And it's good for all of us, I think, to remember two very important lessons from Jesus about this very thing. We find one of them in Luke chapter 6. We read this. He says, Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the splinter that's in your eye, when you yourself don't see the beam in your eye? Hypocrite, first take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take out the splinter from your brother's eye. And then there's the oldie but goodie from Luke 18. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. He says, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, I encourage you to look around the landscape of the churches in the United States of America. Think about all the conflicts, the fights, the splits. Folks, we got a lot of modern-day Pharisees running around in our churches today. And they're causing a lot of damage. Way too puffed up. Self-righteous. Self-important. Way too sure of themselves. And way too eager to point out the faults that they believe they see in other people. In this section of the letter of 2 John, John's reminding us, his readers, that one of the most important practices of the Christian faith, especially within the confines of a church family, is that we demonstrate true love for each other. Gracious, patient, humble, forgiving love. And I want to just tell you that the more difficult the circumstances the churches are facing today from the culture, the world out there, the more important it is to practice that kind of humility and faith and grace inside the church. This is even more important in a world that we live in today. Your church has got to be a place of refuge. It's got to be a place where you come from the world to be spiritually nurtured, to be renewed, 
We need, to, we need to be able to leave these fellowships refreshed and ready to go back out there into that hard world. But that's got to be intentional. We've got to cultivate that. We have to work for that. So John tells us to know the truth. He tells us to practice the truth. And then he tells us to protect the truth. Verse 7, he says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, and they do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so you don't lose what we have, what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't greet him, for the one who greets him shares in his evil works. The author, Alan Bloom, once wrote a very important book with the title, The Closing of the American Mind. And what it was is in this book, Bloom wrote that the single most agreed upon precept on American college campuses today has become that there is no standard of truth. There, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Instead, each person is free to decide for themselves what's true and what's not. You may believe one thing, and that's fine for you. I might believe something else, and that's fine for me. Each thing is true for the person who believes it, and your truth is no more valid than my truth. Widespread in college campuses today. Permeating our entire society. I want to tell you, that perspective is wreaking havoc in our society. In business, it gives business owners a license to be dishonest, to cheat their customers. In the educational system, it's social engineering on steroids. In, 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 yeah, teaching our kids all kinds of dumb stuff that isn't true. In politics, we are very blessed that we have some elected officials like Alan Foster and John, Ro John Rose that we can trust. We know they're men of truth. But they're the exceptions to a large extent. Listen to some of this stuff coming out. We never know who's telling the truth and who isn't. In the family, we have our families falling apart. And increasingly, this is becoming a problem in the churches. Morals and values are subjective and fluid. Every person is free to do what's right in their own eyes. And consequently, in society, people are never sure anymore what's true and what's not, what's right and what's wrong. It's, an all, it's all an open question in our society today. That right there is why a biblical worldview is so essential for Christians. The only absolute and perfectly reliable standard of truth is the Word of God. Amen. And it applies to all people, in all places, at all times. It is not subject to culture or society or politics or anything else. And as Christians, we have to compare everything we're seeing and hearing in the world, but also in the church. Hear me say this. We have to compare everything we're seeing and hearing from the world, but also in the church, to what God says in the Bible. Biblical, biblical commands and biblical principles are the determining factor for us. So, in this section here, John's warning his readers. Uh, he's reminding us um, that false teachers... He says they've gone out into the world, and that's true, but they've also come from the world into the church. They've infiltrated the churches. It was a major problem back then. It's a major problem today. They're spreading false teachings. They're gathering followers around themselves who are helping them to spread the lies. It was happening in their churches back then. It's happening in our churches here today. And so, bringing us back to our opening question about how faithful is faithful enough the answer is that we have to be 100% faithful to the Word of God. We do not have the freedom to deviate from it. We don't have the freedom to alter it in any way. We don't have the freedom to add to it, and we don't have the freedom to take away from it. And that right there is how we can tell who's faithful and true and who isn't. Especially with respect to preachers and teachers and leaders. 
Have they added to or taken away from the Bible? Is their teaching and their practices that they're advocating and even modeling in their own conduct, is it faithful to biblical principles? Or are they playing fast and loose with the truth? Maybe justifying and excusing it away, making it up to suit themselves. Folks, not only are we to know the truth, not only are we to practice the truth, but we have to protect the truth. And then John, he ends here with really what is a a very loving and kind and beautiful word of blessing in verse 12. He says, though I have many things to write to you, I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. And the children of your elect sister send you greetings. You know, you can bet that if John had been able to meet with them in person, I'll bet you he would have used that visit to reinforce everything he's been advocating here for in this letter. And he would do it so that they would be strong, so they would be faithful, so they would be able to stand and honor God in the middle of a very difficult society. I read a story just recently this past week about an archaeological excavation that took place at the site of the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. You may be familiar with the story of Pompeii. It sat at the, uh, at the foot of Mount Vesuvius, which was an active volcano. And in AD 79, Vesuvius erupted, uh, and it destroyed Pompeii. And, and many thousands of people were buried alive in tons of lava and ash. And when the site was unearthed, Um, In modern times, it was discovered that many of the buildings and rooms were still intact, as they had been on the day when the site was buried in ash. It was kind of frozen in time. Uh, And they even found the body of one Roman sentinel, a guard. He had been encased in and preserved by the ash, and he was still standing there, erect, at his post at the city gate. And as the ash showered down upon him, Evidently, he refused to abandon his post. That's how faithful we're to be. Okay? Remain at your post. Don't abandon it for any reason. God has you where he wants you. You have a role to play and a job to do right where you're at. Be faithful. Stand your post. That is how faithful is faithful enough. Let's pray together. Lord, we uh, come before you this morning and we just recognize that every one of us is flawed. Uh, Every one of us has issues. Every one of us sins. None of us are perfect. But we want to be better. And God, so, you know, I just joined with King David in Psalm 51. You know, begin with me, Lord. Uh, Create a a clean heart in me, a pure spirit in me. Uh, And I pray that that's the prayer in every heart here. Start with me, Lord, uh, and then work outward. Let me get the, 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 the log out of my own eye before I turn to look for splinters in somebody else's. Uh, God, help us to be loving. Help us to be long-suffering with each other. Help us to be faithful to what you've called us to do. In this tough, tough world, difficult world, that seems to be getting harder by the day, Help us to be strong and courageous as we stand in the truth that is Jesus Christ, truth of the word of God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to end with a time of invitation, as we always do. Um, And if you've never placed your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I encourage you to do that today. Just pray a simple prayer. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Invite him to put his Holy Spirit in your heart to begin working in your life and changing you into the person he wants you to be. It'll all happen in a moment in time based upon a decision. I encourage you to make that decision now. Uh, If you're here in the sanctuary, just come forward when we're singing here in just a minute. uh, And you can um, just tell me. I'll pray with you and help you to start your new life as a Christian. If you're watching online, just send me a note and I'll get in touch with you. If you don't have a church home, but you'd like to be a member of Oak Hill Baptist, Why don't you tell me that, and I'll tell you how you could join our church. Or if you just need prayer, come and I'll pray with you, or kneel at the altar, or go to the foot of the cross. Uh, For any of those reasons, why don't you respond to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life right now as we're singing.